And if you're a Christian, of course, this applies to you. You can say this with confidence and it would be true. Okay. So this is my Bible. Holy and true like its author. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do in his strength what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And by grace I'll be changed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we just ask your blessing now upon your word. We, we thank you um, that we can come and worship you together. And we come and sing songs that, that are about you and about what you've done for our salvation in and through the Lord Jesus. We, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your so, you're so patient towards us, Father, and we just need your help now. We come dependent. Um, we're talking about a sin that every single one of us does every day nearly, if not every day. And so we need your help. I need your help to deliver your word faithfully, lovingly, humbly, and uh, to be used by you, Lord. And uh, also for you to speak to me as well as to each, each one of us. We've asked this now, that you would come with power, Lord. We just won't play church games, but we would take our relationship with you serious. We'll take your word seriously. We'll take sin seriously and um, so we pray this in Jesus name Amen <coughs> just a little tip when we sang that song that was a call to adore isn't this, this is what it said the, the, the chorus said come let us adore him now if we want to be authentic in being coming to church and worshipping then we would be first of all saying am I adoring him do I actually adore him? Or do, am I really, my heart is elsewhere in what I adore. You know what I'm saying? And if not, honestly, just say, God, help me to adore you. Like when we sing songs, we say, God, speak to him. Here's the audience, not singing to each other mainly. You know what I'm saying? So just interact with God. Make it a living, real, genuine thing. And be honest with God. He sees your heart. He knows whether you're just giving lip service. You know what I'm saying? Your heart is elsewhere and you're just singing, yeah, I adore you, God. You're such, so amazing. And he looks in our hearts. So let's just uh, be honest there. Now, think about, think with me about our lives in a general way, okay? Unless you've been living in some sort of dream world, which I hope you haven't, you don't need to exist too, too long on this planet to know that life is full of difficulties. Every, even children, younger than you, okay, even children or youth who may not even know many of the life's problems like you do when you get older, they still experience difficulties and disappointments um, that are the result of living in a broken and fallen world. For example, Malachi has been um, looking forward to this coming week um, because he has on Wednesday, I think, the Book Week Parade, okay, where he can dress up in a costume that we've got for him and there's lots of fun activities like jumping castles and stuff like that. And, and, and he also has, he's seen, um, he has seen sickness go through our family a few weeks ago and again this week, unfortunately, with... Uh, with our kids getting sick and including him. And so the other day he said this, Daddy, next week, if I'm sick, can we still get dressed up at home and do fun activities at home when I get better? And I said to him, of course, Malachi, um, that would be fun. But how about we can also pray to God, also pray to God and ask him to protect you from getting sick if that's his will. You know what I'm saying? So let's pray. And we prayed. See, life is... So often 
difficult and sometimes very painful and even little kids experience these things. And our difficulties can come in the form of getting a common cold, um, your car breaking down, losing your wallet, the pressures of work or study. And they usually occur in the ordinary activities and responsibilities of life. Whereas we can also experience, thankfully, less often and during extraordinary events in our lives, very painful things. Very painful things, like losing a loved one, your parents separating. That's a huge thing for children to go through. Very painful. Losing your job, failing at school, getting cancer or infertility, whatever. See, life, life in a fallen world, fallen, broken world by sin is often difficult and sometimes very painful. And as Christians, the big issue is not the difficulties or the painful experiences. They are going to be with us until we die. Or into, unless, unless the Lord Jesus comes back, okay? They're going to be with us. The big issue is how we respond to them. How do we respond to them? And sadly, the common response to our difficulties, whether small or big, is in the form of anxiety and or frustration. Okay? And or frustration. So if you, for example, you might have a bit of a giggle, my anxieties have anxieties. If you get that, well, have a laugh. Okay? <laughs> you can worry about being worried, okay? That's what I say. So, so because anxiety and frustration are, are such a common and even natural response that we have to problems and difficulties and issues, we need to address it in our series, which is acceptable sins, battling the sins we so often ignore and so, e and so easily entangle us, okay? So this may be a shock to you, but anxiety and frustration is a sin, and often a sin we accept and tolerate, a sin we don't see and a, and a sin that we don't respond to and battle against. Okay? Now, I'm going to, soon I'm going to give you some reasons why I believe it's a sin. Okay? Not just something we have to tolerate. The sermon title is Dealing with Anxiety. Dealing with Anxiety. And all of us deal with anxiety. All of us experience anxiety. And we need to see our anxiety as a sin if we're going to battle against it. We need to deal with our anxiety. What is the opposite of being anxious? Would you say having an inner assurance and peace in the midst of the difficulties that have come into our life? An inner assurance of peace, yes? So as Christians... How can we attain this peace? How can we attain this peace? Well, for non-Christians, because they don't know God and they are not in a right relationship with God, um, then God and his peace that he offers us is out of the equation, okay? They can't experience his peace because they don't know him. So the way, the, so the, way, the only way unbelievers try and get some sort of peace in their problems is through ways that are not God-honouring and ways that I think don't bring true, absolute peace with what God can bring. Here's some examples, not all these other ways, but they seek, unbelievers seek peace through what I call a blind faith or positive thinking, okay? So... And I'm saying this because some of you may be genuine Christians but try, deal with your anxieties and problems this way. And I'm saying it's wrong. So they can deal with it through a blind faith, a positive thinking. Though, see, through believing some real, unrealistic notion that things will only get better. Have you heard that? Sometimes this may be true. Sometimes it may not be true. For example, they say, I'm, I'm sure this cancer will pass and I'll be in good health soon. Really? Maybe? Maybe not. Or, or okay, I lost my job, but I'll get another one. Or, so this, this she'll be okay, 
she, she'll be okay attitude may give a person some sort of feelings of reassurance, but because it's not based on the reality of, the, of our life, of the uncertainty of life, true peace cannot be attained. You got that? It's blind faith. It's positive thinking. Unbelievers also seek peace through avoidance or escape. So before we go there, can I say this? If you're a Christian, don't try peace that way. Because you're lying to yourself and you're assuming, you know what I'm saying? Just say that, oh, everything's going to be okay. She'll be okay. Unbelievers also seek peace through avoidance or escape of the difficulty or the difficulties of life. So why, why is alcohol the great socially acceptable drug in the world. Why? Well, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why the consumption of alcohol is so prevalent in, is because it is used, listen, as a poor substitute, a poor substitute um, to get peace or some sort of relief from the difficulties of life. And you don't need to be an alcoholic to use it this way. For example, how many people use it to unwind, to de-stress after a difficult day or a hard week at work or school or uni, not school. <laughs> not school. But, but alcohol is just one example of the thousands upon thousands of things we can take refuge in to gain some sort of peace amidst the difficulties of our life that aren't the true refuge and peace. Once again, it may feel good, it may take our minds off our problems for a while, but avoidance and escape is never the way to true peace. It just delays it, doesn't it? So for the Christian, though we can actually shamefully in our ungodliness forfeit God's peace by seeking artificial peace in the ways I've just mentioned, there is only one true and lasting peace. A peace that transcends our circumstances. A peace of God. Peace from our God. And there is only one way to receive this peace from him. It starts with F. What is it? Faith. Good on you, George. Faith. See, we believers need to trust God in our difficult and even painful circumstances. Now, the Bible, including Old Testament and New Testament, have a lot to say about trusting God. Uh, Jerry Bridges, in his book that this series is based upon, documented a survey that he did of the entire New Testament, recording, listen to this, instances where he... We're recording instances where various Christian character traits or virtues were taught by command or by example. And listen to what he found, you listen. He found 27 different character traits of what God wants us to have in our lives. And then he says this, what would you expect to be at the one at the top that's most taught by command or by example? It starts with L. Love, very good. Love as you would expect was taught most often some 50 times in the New Testament. Humility came in second with 40 instances. Do you know what came in third? Trust in God in whatever circumstances was taught 13 or more times. So, G so, so the Bible emphasises trust God. But you know, Jesus equally had a lot to say about anxiety. One of the main passages that he speaks about is the one we just read earlier in the service, Matthew 6. Now in 10 verses from Matthew 6, 25 to 34, Jesus uses the word anxious six times, commanding his followers not to be anxious, meaning anxious, he says, don't be anxious about what you eat or drink or wear or even about the unknown circumstances of tomorrow. Look at, look at verse 25 of Matthew 6. Therefore, Jesus said, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And then he says, verse 31. Therefore, 
do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Verse 34, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day. It's sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Do you see what he's trying to say? Jesus in this passage clearly commands us believers not to be anxious. Yet there's another expression he used that carried the same meaning. Fear not. Fear not. Fear and anxiety go hand in hand. As, and, 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 um, and as you would expect, Jesus, um, and often you say, fear not, peace be with you. And why did Paul often say at the start of his letters, and then the peace of God, so important. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Paul says, and the apostles just echo Jesus' teaching. Look at Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 6-7, do not be anxious about anything. Do you see it? Do you, do you hear what he's saying? There's, there's no, oh, it's, it's, as a parent, it's okay to be anxious about your kids because they're your kids, you love them. Paul says, anything. anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ you see see we can get a peace when everything is calm in our life you know what I'm saying no problems no difficulties peace that's understandable but when there's no peace out there and you you know and and things are not good and difficulties are coming and you still have a peace, the world can't explain that. Surpasses all understanding, human understanding. Have you experienced that peace? The Apostle Peter, 1 Peter says this, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your what? Anxieties on him, on God, because he cares for you. See, this exhortation from Peter tells us what we already know. You're listening? That we all have anxieties. But like Paul who told us to deal with our anxiety by looking to God through prayer. Peter also tells us to deal with our anxiety, to battle anxiety by looking Godward, by casting our anxieties on God. But to cast something, think about casting something. When I was a child, when I was at primary school and high school, a little bit lower high school, I used to get in big problems picking up rocks and throwing them. I loved to throw things and and uh, not good when you're at school and throwing at things you shouldn't be throwing at. But, but you know, but, but if to cast something means we are to let go of it, true? If I was to cast a stone in my hand, does this mean that the stone remains in my hand? No. To cast something is to get rid of it. So if I turn to God with my, with, with uh, my many or few ang anxieties and by faith cast them to him, on him, then, I will, then we will truly relinquish and hand over them and be filled with his peace, okay? And I hope you've experienced that, fellow Christians. I hope you've gone to him in prayer full of anxiety and you've, and you've, walked, you've come out of that prayer full of his peace. It's a wonderful feeling. Nothing's changed in your circumstance, but you've changed. See, we cannot truly say, I casted my anxieties on God and still have them. Now, don't hear me wrong. We can truly cast them to God and experience his peace. This is my experience. But then the moment we stop trusting God again, 
in the situation that we're in, we pick up our anxiety again. And then we need to press repeat and, re- can, and go back to him and cast our anxieties back on him. You see that? So we have seen that Jesus commands us to not be anxious. We have seen the apostles writing with divine authority and inspiration, exhorting us to deal with our anxieties by turning to God and casting our anxieties on him. So what can we conclude from this? Conclude from this. This is it. The moral will of God is that we Christians be not anxious, but live in the peace of God. You got that? That's what God wants for us. That's his will for us. Or to say it more explicitly in the negative, anxiety is a sin because we are commanded not to be anxious and to be anxious means to be a sin. Now, I'm I'm no doctor, as you know, but I've been around long enough to know that there is a form of clinical anxiety like depression, clinical depression. But let me say this. But even though there are things that may contribute to some people's anxiety, like hormones, certain mental illnesses, you know what I'm saying? Most of our anxiety, most of our anxiety, and if not nearly all of anxiety, stems, comes from reacting to our external circumstances without faith in God. You got that? It does. So don't pull out the card that says that gives you that lets you off the hook and says, "Oh, anxieties are a condition, a disorder, and therefore it's not a sinful thing. It's not a moral thing. It's not a spiritual thing. It is." Okay. If we do that, we won't battle against it. We'll just treat it as a tolerable, acceptable sin in our life, and it kills faith. It stems from faithlessness. You may know this already, but let me give you two reasons why anxiety is a sin. Okay, two reasons. Number one, anxiety is a distrust of God. Distrust of God. The reason why anxiety or frustration is a sin and taught in the Bible as something we need to flee from is because, as I said earlier, it is opposite to trusting God. If we are anxious or frustrated in our faith, our trusting is not resting in God at that moment. And to distrust God is a sin. This is me getting back to the sin of ungodliness. You see that? Sin of ungodliness. Let me show you from the Bible, not just what I say, Hebrews 11.6, okay? We need to get this right, that this is an acceptable sin. Hebrews 11.6. Man of Christians I meet who don't believe this is a sin. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God, to please Him. Without faith. So what does it say, once again, getting back to the ungodliness sermon, what does it say about unbelievers? Do they have faith in God? No, they don't. They have zero relationship with him. So therefore, their whole life is in not pleasing God. Even if they do good stuff. It's not. So what, with us, the same is true for Christians, isn't it? If what we do doesn't come from faith, we are not pleasing God. Now, if you want to argue with me, read that verse. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Let me show you another verse in the positive, Romans 14, 23. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. But whoever has doubts, Romans 14, 23, whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. That's faith in God, guys. Faith in God. Dependence on God. Anything that does not come out of trusting, depending on God, is sin. So anxiety for me, I, I don't know, definitely does not proceed from faith. It doesn't. Anx- anxiety actually proceeds from faithlessness, not trusting God. You cannot have your faith in God and be anxious. 
Jesus said in Matthew 6 passage that if our heavenly Father takes care of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, will he not much more take care of our temporal needs as his children and he's our Father? The question is rhetorical. Of course God will take care of our needs, our temporal physical needs. So the implication is don't get anxious about those things. Trust God and his loving provision. You got that? It's a, Peter, it's a call to trust God. Peter told us that the, theolo, um, the theological basis of our casting our anxieties on God is that he cares for us. So casting our anxieties on God is a call to trust God and his loving care for us and his loving provision for us. So when I succumb to anxiety, I'm, I'm in effect believing that God is not caring for me and that he will not t take care of me in the particular circumstance that, I'm, that, that is triggering my anxiety. Got that? Our anxiety is shouting to us and to the world around us, to others, that we are not trusting God. It's, it's a beautiful warning from God. But if you read it as, if you don't even read it, see the symptoms that if I'm anxious, I've got to go deep before, b below the anxiety, get, get past what the anxiety is causing, abruptness or impatience or whatever it's causing, anger, and get to the heart and saying, God, I'm not trusting you at this moment. That's why I'm anxious. Let me deal with that. Got it? It's a warning sign. Everyone knows, well, most of the time, unless you uh, have heart in your heart, to anxiety that has become so natural and normal that you just live with anxiety all the time, which is very dangerous. Anxiety is shouting to us and to others that we are not trusting God and not trusting our Heavenly Father is a sin that produces many other sins and we all do it. The second reason why anxiety is a sin is because, number two, anxiety is not accepting God's providence. Not accepting God's providence. Now, you may be thinking that is, that is really the same as the first reason of, dis, of distrusting God, and you're absolutely dead right. Not accepting God's providential working in, in our life stems from faithlessness, not trusting God. And some of you may know may not know what providence means. So let me give you a definition of providence. Okay, God's providence can be simply defined as God's controlling and orchestrating all circumstances and events in his universe for his glory and the uttermost good of his people. You got that? It's God's controlling and orchestrating everything, all circumstances and all events in his universe for his own glory and for the uttermost good of his people, okay? That's what God's providence means. Some of you, I know, will struggle to believe that God does in fact control and orchestrate all events and circumstances. I understand that. Now, if that's you and you are a Christian then I plead with you to not just accept it as biblically true, come and speak to me, but not just accept it, but come to rejoice in it as wonderful. It is wonderful. The truth that my God is able to work all things, good and bad, together for my uttermost good, that's Romans 8.28, is glorious. Absolutely glorious. This means that I can trust him in all things. Unfortunately, I don't, but that means we can trust him because he's, in, he's, he's orchestrating all things. But unfortunately, even if we believe that God, can, even if you believe that God, like I do, controls all things and orchestrates all things for his glory and for our good as Christians, then we can often lose sight and not trust this truth when we are going through tough times. Man, I've done it so many times. Instead, that we, we can do what, what, what we can do is to set our minds on the immediate causes of our anxiety rather than remember and believe that those immediate causes are under the sovereign control of our loving God. Okay? You see, this expression of distrusting God is really 
deep down an unwillingness to trust, to submit to, and to gladly embrace God's agenda for me. God's agenda for me. It's a form of rebellion, actually. Anxiety, and God is so gracious, God is so patient with it. Anxiety silently and not so and sometimes not so silently says in our hearts, my agenda, my plans, my desires of what I think should be happening is not happening. Got that? Is not happening. Whereas God wants us to say from the heart, here is, this is, I put it, try to put it in like a prayer. God, I'm struggling with, you name whatever you're struggling with. I'm struggling with, this is the second week now that my kids got sick and now they, they got better and they're sick again within two weeks. So I'm struggling with that, God, and I believe that you are infinitely loving and wise who understands how I feel uh, in my pain and my struggle to accept what is happening. But God, I also believe that you're in control of this. Help me to trust in you and rest there. Give me your peace, please, God. That's battling against, that's battling against our anxiety. Now, I need to make another clarification, just in case you take me the wrong way. Accepting and gladly embracing God's providence, providential will, does not mean that we should not pray for God to change things, okay? Jesus is the perfect example. Jesus, the sinless son of man, when facing the dread of his impending suffering on the cross, prayed, remember, my father, if it be, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Perfect example of how to deal with our troubles. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 pleaded to the Lord, how many times? Three times. That he would take, that the Lord would take this mysteriously painful thing in his life called a thorn in the flesh away from him. Three times Paul pleaded. So what does that say? There's nothing wrong with asking God to take the difficulties of our life away, change our situation so that it's better. But what did, Paul, what did the Lord say to Paul? Did he say yes or no to taking the thorn away? Susanna, do you remember? He said no. He said my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not taking away, Paul. This is the Apostle Paul. I'm not, I'm, you, it's going to stay there, but I, you know what? My grace is sufficient. I'm, gonna, you know, I can, I'm all that you need to help you through that thorn. And it was, call, it was a call to Paul to trust and to rest in his Lord, with, even with the thorn, whatever it was. So it's totally appropriate to pray for relief and even for deliverance from whatever circumstances is triggering our anxiety, but we need to always do so with, listen, with, humble, with a humble attitude of, I am dust, I am man, and God, well, he's God. Okay, and be willing to trust Whatever God's agenda, providential, sovereign will may be, knowing that God's will is always far better than what I think should happen. And then to seek his peace. Good question to think about is, are, you, are we able to recognise the, type, the types of circumstances that tend to make us anxious more? leave that with you. So let me recap for now. Anxiety is a sin because it stems from the root of unbelief. Unbelief in not trusting God and not accepting his providential will for us. Therefore we need to battle our anxiety by having the shield of faith in one hand and the sword of the spirit, the word of God, in another hand. Now I want to give you two examples of fighting anxiety, okay? One biblical from the Bible, one my own example. And uh, as I tell you an example, this example that I'm going to use of Isaiah is an example where I've failed many times and I've also seen God's peace and victory over my anxiety many times. So, but let me go, go to, if you've got your Bible, go to 2 Samuel 16. It's up on the board. This is, the passage is a little bit long. 2 Samuel 16, 5 to 12. You just turn there.
This is something you may have not ever noticed in the life and life of King David. But I want you to see that David experiences some really difficult event in his life, experience, and how he responds to that and what gave him the ability to respond the way he did. Okay? 2 Samuel 16, 5 to 12. If you don't have your Bible, just if you're a good listener, just listen. This is, he's already committed murder and adultery. God's used Nathan the prophet to bring him to repentance and God's forgiven him for all that. But then now there's, there's huge consequences of that sin in his house where his son Absalom wants to kill him and take the throne. Okay? Not a good thing when your son wants to kill you. 2 Samuel 16, five, starting in verse 5. When King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. Now remember this, David cooked the kingdom from the house of Saul. So this guy is pro-Saul, anti-David, okay? Whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerar. And he came, and as he came, he cursed continually. That's cursed David. And he threw stones at David and at all, and, and, and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left hand. So think about this, he's a king, he's got all these soldiers and servants lining up next to David, and what guts does this guy have to be hurling insults and curses and rocks at David, at a king? Verse 7, And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. So he's pro-Absalom. See, your evil is on you. You are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. Pretty cool. How dare he insult the king? But the king said, this is David, What have I to do with you, sons of Zariah? If he is cursing, say it with me, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall I say, Why have you done so? Meaning, why will... And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Hear that? The Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. Do you see the God-centred perspective? The immediate cause is here's this other fellow human hurling insults, throwing stones, and David was able to look behind that to his God and say, I see, I see your hand in this God, I'm trusting you. He could react with anger, obviously he cut the guy's head off, anxiety, frustration, but he sees, he knew his God, he knew how sovereign his God was and he's seen God protect his life over and over and over. His trust was in God. That helped him to respond well, you see? If he didn't trust God, how would he have responded? Another example for Isaiah. Look at Isaiah. Bless his heart. Now the reason Isaiah has been a source of anxiety for Lily and I is because he may, with his autism, may forever, until we forever live with us and never be able to get married or leave home or get a job, we don't know. It's unknown exactly. We know he's progressing and he's growing, but with his autism, we don't know how much that will be and how independent he will be. So how do we deal with that? Like, every parent has the anxiety of the kid's life, future life. But when you've got a kid with disability, so how do we deal with that? So God, I know that you gave us, you gave us Isaiah, and you gave us a child with autism. That was no coincidence. He gave us this child. And he's beautiful. 
in every way. That means that if the future, we trust you in the future for Isaiah, whatever it may be. Now for us to do that, you know what? We have to, if we say to ourselves, the idea of him living with us, if we hold on to this thing of, when our, we can't wait till the kids leave home and then it's just Lily and I and we've got our freedom back again. That's a form of rebellion saying, God, I'm not accepting your agenda for my life. But at this moment, and that will cause a lot of anxiety and frustration, but at this moment, God, I, I hand that over. If, and I submit to you, and I trust you for his eyes. Whether that means that he's with us for the rest of his life, you know what? It's, probably, it's best that he gets out there and gets a job and he can have normal relationships. So we pray for that. But if not, we, at this moment, we rest in you and trust his future into, his, into it. And we, you know what I'm saying? And the peace of God comes. It's acknowledging God's sovereignty over his life now, over the fact that he's given us a child with, with disability and over his future. Now, anxiety has a close sister, the sin of frustration. Anxiety involves fear, whereas frustration, more often than not, involves being upset or even angry at whatever or whoever is blocking our plans. Okay, I'll give you one example of a pastor. I won't tell you his name. Now, the reason why I want to give him an example is I could tell you many examples of... of um, he's a guy who suffers with anxiety and frustration, so I'm not judging this guy, but it was a good example, so let me show you. You don't know him. Okay, so there's a pastor in Queensland, and one day I came to his house before the church service, and he was doing the printing the bulletins. In his, he had the office in his home, and I was waiting for him to print the bulletins, and the, the printer wasn't working, and time's running out, church service is about to begin. We had to get to the church. And then, in his frustration, he just exploded. Rage, throwing things in his office, getting angry. I thought the printer was gonna come flying out the door. Pastor. And back then I looked down and think, man, you call yourself a pastor? But now I would never say that because <laughs> Because uh, I've seen the seeds of frustration and anger in my own life. But it's all because of frustration. His plans were blocked. So this sort of reaction to our circumstances stems from the sin of ungodliness. Why? Well, at that moment I'm living as though God is not in control and involved in my life or my circumstances. You got that? It is easy to fail to see the invisible hand of God behind whatever is causing my frustration. You agree? If we are honest, we would say that often in the heat of the moment, we tend to not even think about God at all. Instead, our attention is solely on the earthly source of our frustration. And when it comes to God's sovereignty over my life, he's like, and let me just try to give you an example. He's like an a, a, a eternal security guard. This is my picture of the biblical picture of God's sovereignty, okay? Picture a house and your life is a house. And there is only one entry into this house. And have a guess who's at the door? The eternal security guard, God. Nothing enters the house unless my all-powerful, perfectly loving God permits it to come in. Nothing. You see, if I can remember this truth, and it's biblical, it's true, that whatever enters my life, God has permitted to come. Not just permitted, but ordained. Then this will help me to, tr to be able to trust in him and fight anxiety and frustration. And it's, like I said, I can say ordained because look at Psalm 139, verse 16. We're coming, coming near to the end of conclusion. But look at Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes... Your God doesn't have eyes, but he, he's all seeing. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So what does that mean? In other words, all my days have been ordained, planned out by God before any of them have happened. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that 
in 10,065 days, my days will end. And God has ordained that. That's true. I believe he has ordained the days that I live. But in that passage, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that the events in those days have been planned before they even happened. Such is our great God. And this should be wonderfully encouraging and comforting thought. How can we battle frustration? Let me put, let me put into a prayer again. Lord, this circumstance, as difficult and frustrating as it seems, is part of your plan for my life now. If you'd be willing, take it away. I ask you to change the situation. But help me to trust you and honour you by willingly submitting myself to your good and perfect will. And please, Lord, as you give me your peace, I need your wisdom and direction on how to address the situation that is tempting me to get frustrated. Because at the end of the day is, and, uh, I nearly gave his name, the pastor had to get, well, well, in some sense, he had probably had to say, well, at the end of the day is, God hasn't allowed the church to have a bulletin. Or maybe God's saying, well, how about you don't do the bulletins on Sunday morning for the church service? Maybe do it a bit more better time management during the week. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is, it's, God, give me wisdom to deal with the frustration. But first, deal with my anxiety, my frustration first, then give me the wisdom to deal with the situation. There are no circumstances in our lives that don't ultimately come to us from the invisible hand of God, even though they come through visible causes. So let me conclude by restating what has already been said. Both anxiety and frustration are sins. Therefore, we should not treat them lightly or brush them off as some um, common or normal reaction that we have to our difficulties. Reality is that we will never, yes, the reality is that we will never achieve complete um, freedom from anxiety and frustration in this life. Absolutely, I know that. And every one of us get anxious and frustrated, but are we battling against it? But we should never accept them as just part of who we are. Fellow Christians, let's enter the battle together against dealing with our anxiety and frustration. But also, let's, be, let's, let's um, be loving and empathetic and gentle with others, with each other, um, who are anxious and frustrated. Don't beat someone over the head and say, which I don't think you guys would do. You, you, trust in God. Get over your problem. You know what I'm saying? Shove, shove a bubble verse down their throat. Empathise with their anxiety as a person who, do, who struggles with anxiety. Empathise with someone who deals with frustrations. Don't look down at them because they're not trusting God. But also, if you come humbly, then you're able to then help them to maybe see God's invisible hand, which they just already know, but help them to see God's invisible hand so they can behind the really difficult situations. And we should be encouraging each other to battle against our anxiety. But if you're an unbeliever, guys, last thing, then you are, by pushing God aside, you are forfeiting his peace, peace with God and peace from God. Let me explain that. Okay? At the moment, you're not at peace with God. Your sin has caused a separation between you and him. You're his enemy. You're not at peace with him. When you die, you won't rest in peace in heaven. You would die in torment in hell. That's not resting in peace. Whatever's on your grave. But God says, I sent my son to die on the cross so that you, so that you, can, I can, be, you can be reconciled to me, enemy, friend. Isn't that wonderful? And so when you become my friend, then I offer you my peace in this broken world until one day I fix the broken world. He wants us to experience it. The Prince of Peace wants us to experience his peace now. But I hope in the last few sermons, if you're not a Christian and you don't realise, oh, what do I need a saviour? You'll see the depth of our sin. We are far more evil than we ever imagined, far more love than we ever dreamed. That's what these things are saying. With our sin. It goes more than just murdering people, hating people, Stealing, 
goes far deeper than that, our sin. Let's pray. Father, we just, once again, save the non-Christians, Father, and, and rescue us Christians from anxiety and frustration. Help us to be a conscious of, conscious of you, God, in our difficulties and help us to honour you more and more so by casting our anxieties on you, Father. Just help us to be more aware of our anxieties and frustrations and God, in your strength, help us to um, fight it by faith. Lord, just give us, help us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.